one o'clock. I can't make the wrong move. And a quorum of the board is <laughs> present. Like so we'll recall the State Board of Education meeting to order. First item of business is public participation in the State Board of Education meeting. Marilyn, are there individuals who wish to address the board? There are. And I will remind you, some of you may have heard this, I apologize for that, but if you weren't here, we're going into public participation. You will each have three minutes to address the board. If you have handouts, if you will give it to the person closest to you at the table, they will be happy to distribute that for you. Um, I will let you know who is speaking. You'll just come to the end of the table here and, um, and sit right beside the computer where the computer is. Um, and then um, I will let you also know who is the next person on deck. So Melanie Curtis is the first speaker and she will be followed by Jennifer Murray. And we will be ready whenever you are. Hi, I'm Melanie Curtis. I'm from Plainwell, Michigan. Most of you know me. Um, I've been a visitor and I ran for state board uh, back a couple years ago. Uh, welcome to the job. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here to ask you to not approve the next generation science standards for Michigan. As you had indicated, many citizens attended the information sessions and, and I thank you for conducting these sessions and I hope that you will continue to listen to the citizens. I have uh, three important points that I'd like you to consider. First, the department has indicated adoption of these standards will be a huge undertaking for schools and yet we're, we have not received information uh, about the cost of implementation. As all of you already know, the Michigan Constitution requires that you inform the legislature of costs and it's in uh, Article 8, Section 3. So it seems to me it would be prudent to have some idea of how much it would cost before you would approve them. Second, by MDE's own admission, there is no evidence that these standards will improve educational outcomes for students. On October 17th, in an email, Joseph Grajic, uh, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, indicated the research results will not be available for another year or two. So you don't have any evidence that these standards will actually improve student outcomes. So it does not seem prudent to approve standards that will require this huge transition effort and cost with no evidence. And finally, there's a very important question about ownership of the standards. Who owns the standards? Can the data codes that I detail the standards be modified? And who has the authority to change them? Some indication was made by the department that the next generation science standards were modified for Michigan, but it was unclear as to the extent. It's also not clear that the state would vote to surrender Michigan's ability to own and control its own educational standards. Considering the cost, the lack of uh, evidence of potential student learning, and the questions of ownership, please exercise prudent leadership by not approving the Next Generation Science Standards for Michigan. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Sharing your thoughts. Jennifer Murray is the next speaker, followed by Tamara Carlone. Sure can, sure can. Tamara Carlone, please. And she will be followed by Joel Krejcik. Hi, I'm Tamara Carlone. I'm a mom from Northville uh, Schools District. Um, I'm a CPA and a, um, a quality um, improvement expert in um, corporate America. I've been watching the process of um, the implementation approval of these standards. And I see a lot of errors and a lot of uh, things that cause a lot of concern. When I'm given a set of standards um, that have a lot of errors in them, and they've, I've been told in these sales pitch meetings that MDE put on all over the state that, you know, 30,000 people or whatever have seen these, et cetera, and they call our country a democracy, that type of thing. <coughs> you know, it's just, it's a cause of great concern. Um, 
I see, I know we're talking about science today, uh, today, but just my example in terms of this is in relation to something I missed earlier. You guys handed this out in relation to social studies. The first thing on the addressing feedback, the pros and cons of, well, the, the democracy comment um, says that, that that's not a part of the C3 framework. Um, I have the C3 framework right here, and it actually is exactly from the C3 framework. So when I see all these errors, I get very concerned. Um, in regards to the, the science standards, um, I was um, at a meeting last night, and uh, I, I just kind of said to everybody, I'm like, they're, they're going to pass these standards today. What do you think? The whole room was against it. These meetings are at a time where it's very hard for people to come in. I mean, people are working and going to school. I want you to know, to know that. It's hard for me to be here right now. Um, running, you know, job, running a family, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's tough to be here. This is important. I don't get paid for this. This is, out of, you know, actually cost me money to be here. So I, I passed this around at that meeting. This is a petition to you guys. You can have it. Um, the petition to vote no on the proposed science standard. This is one meeting I happen to be at, and it's four pages of names. Please don't pass these standards. Okay? This is one meeting I happen to be at. It would be very easy for me to get a lot more names, and you're welcome to have that. Thank you. Um, in terms of the science standards, um, they're unproven, and our children are not guinea pigs. I've seen the Common Core standards, you know, treat our kids like guinea pigs. Bill Gates is a major funder. He spent over a billion dollars in all these standards. And um, he has said it'll take 10 years to figure out whether this stuff works or not. That's not acceptable to me. Thank God my kids are graduating, one's at U of M and one's in 12th grade, because I don't want to have, have them anything to do with this. If I had young kids right now, I'd pull them out of the system, no doubt about it. Um, uh, the national origins of these standards are, in my opinion, illegal and un unconstitutional. Um, there's been a national outcry against Common Core. Why would we adopt Common Core aligned standards? Uh, the standards are based on a political ide ideology and they lack intellectual integrity. Why would we go from bad to worse standards as per individual ratings? It's unacceptable and invasive to collect the data required by these standards. <clears throat> Independent parents were excluded from the development process. The standards have been funded by special interest. I as a parent can tell you these are unacceptable. I could go on forever, but I'm out of time. I appreciate your attention. Thank you for being here. The next speaker is Joel Krasick, followed by James Emmerling. Hi, I'm Joe Krasick. I'm a professor of science education at Michigan State University. And I'm also the director of Create for STEM, uh, which is an institute that is interested in promoting the uh, teaching and learning of science, K through 16. Uh, I've been involved in teaching science since 1972. I've been involved in teaching science and preparing teachers to teach science in this state since 1990. I've been involved in development of the next generation of science standards since its inception in 2008. With the framework, I served as the lead writer for the physical science standards uh, for the framework, as well as on the leadership team at NGSS. Let me start by saying that the new Science Michigan standards are based upon solid research about the teaching and learning of science, <coughs> because it's based upon the framework for K-12 science education. The framework for K-12 science education was produced by the National Research Council, uh, which is a body in our country. And it was done under very careful development. As you may know, any report that comes out of the National Research Council has to be the most solid research that our nation has. Moreover, when it's produced, it has to be approved by the National Academy of, by the scientists of the National Academy of Science. This is probably the most prestigious body in the country, if not in the world. And they put their stamp of approval on the next on the framework for K-12 science education. That document served as the basis for the development of the next generation of science standards, which is the basis of the new Michigan science standards. Those, th those documents, the next generation of science standards, also went through very careful vetting by organizations throughout our nation, including the American Chemical Society, 
American Physical Society, the National Science Teachers Association. Moreover, Michigan teachers had a, 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 a tremendous impact on the development of that document. Michigan was one of, one of the 13 lead states and gave a very important um, feedback to that committee on developing the document. So teachers in Michigan were instrumental in developing it. Let me also say that the new standards are going to prepare our kids not for yesterday, not for today, but also for tomorrow. Those standards are based upon how do we help our kids be able to use their knowledge so they can solve problems, which our state needs, how they can make sense of, 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 of phenomena. So the standards that you have in front of you are new, but they are to prepare our kids for the future. They are based upon the idea of integration of both content and practice. And I also want to stress that they also built K through 12. Our nation never had a focus, our state never had a fake fo focus on how we develop understanding across time. So if we want to prepare our students for the future in which they live, adopting these new standards will do that. They will help move our state forward uh, into being able to uh, have a state in which we're economically viable and which we're economically sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, Thank you. for being here. Our next speaker is James Emerling, followed by Michelle Frederick. Hello, I'm James Emerling. I'm the Genesee Area Mathematics and Science Center Director, and so I'm here to represent both the Michigan Mathematics and Science Center Network and Genesee ISD. In both cases, we're, uh, we're there to serve the needs of local teachers and teachers across the state. Um, Michigan is okay. one of the most STEM-rich states in the entire country. Um, when I meet with industry representatives in my local region, they tell me uh, of their needs for engineers, for designers, for computer scientists, and uh, even healthcare workers. And yet in education, we haven't filled those needs. Um, and, and we can see evidence of this uh, hemorrhaging in the STEM pipeline begins back in elementary school, if you look at our, our, our current results. Um, and, and, and part of the, the reason for that is this myopic focus that we've had on simply uh, on, on the basic skills of both mathematics and ELA. While mathematics and ELA are very, very important, they require that application to really make them uh, vital to uh, extending knowledge beyond its basic use. And as such, we have the opportunity to make a difference today. Your vote is, is, is more than just a vote to, to say standards, uh, to approve standards, but it's more about uh, sending a signal to educators uh, and to families and to kids that says science is important <coughs> and that the application of those basic skills is important. And it also is a signal to those community members, those industry representatives, that, that, that we value their needs and we want to fill those positions with our kids, not kids from other countries or other states which is what's currently happening. So when you're ready to make this decision, the Michigan Mathematics and Science Center is poised to, to, to help you in, in guiding teachers across the state. So we have 33 mathematics and science centers all spread across the entire state of Michigan. And as such, we've been spending the last few years developing a deep understanding of the framework as, as uh, Mr. Krejcik, or Dr. Krejcik just talked about and educating and bringing together a whole community of science education facilitators from higher education on down to uh, preschool even including some of the informal education community and we're trying to make sure that this is more than just uh, more than just a few teachers but in order to really make the kind of significant change that we want to, to make it requires this entire community and we all need to be behind it and we all need to, uh, to to make some significant changes it can't be just a fraction of the teachers okay and so we've got to develop this understanding across the entire state thank you so james i urge you to, uh, to vote yes <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being here our next speaker is michelle frederick followed by senator patrick kolbeck Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the mother of two children currently attending the Wald Lake Consolidated School District in, o in Oakland County. I'm here today to voice my opposition to the adoption of the Next Generation Science Standards. First, I've attended three of the so-called informational meetings 
that were held across the state of Michigan concerning the proposed standards. I attended the Detroit, Flint, and Lansing meetings. I cannot express my utter disappointment with how the meetings were run. It was solely a sales pitch with no meaningful dialogue concerning the proposed standards. All questions had to be placed on a sticky note. Only selected questions were answered that went with the agenda of the sales pitch. I seriously questioned State Superintendent Brian Winston's letter dated October 27, 2015 to the State Board of Education that most online comments were in support of the science standards. At the three meetings I did attend, most were in opposition to the, stand, to the adoption. Only people showing supported, the only people supporting the standards were the people present that had supposedly worked on the standards, which there were quite a few planted throughout the audience. No one from Michigan developed the science standards. According to Stephen <coughs> Pruitt, who managed the standards development process from Achieve, that the states only provided feedback, which they took seriously. He also added, quote, the standards must remain true to the National Resource Council framework, which leads me to my second point. Secondly, this is not state-led. Let me repeat, it is not state-led. The standards were created by, a non -government, by other non-government organizations like Achieve, which is funded in part by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, just like the Common Core State Standards Initiative was, which the proposed standards are aligned to. At the Detroit meeting, we were told that an independent review was done by SRI International, that the standards were better than what, they, what we currently teach our children. Upon further research, SRI International is not so independent as, the, as what was portray, portrayed to be. They too have received grant money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which outlines a conflict of interest for the standards that are up for consideration today. Which will bring me to my last and final point, due to time constraints. Finally, SRI International ranked the next generation science standards to be superior than what Michigan currently has. According to the Fordham Institute, the current Michigan standards are classified with a C rating and on the numerical scale received a 6 out of 10 rating, whereas the next generation science standards also received a C rating and a 5 out of 10 on the numeric rating. Why are we moving in a lateral, slightly lower direction and not up? The National Assessment of Education Progress Framework and Trends in International Math and Science Study Framework are by far superior with an A- rating and a 9 out of 10 respectively. At the meetings I've attended, several asked what is the cost analysis to implement these proposed <coughs> standards. No one was able to answer the, this simple question significantly. So who pays? The cash-strapped districts? the constantly rated state's educational fund? I'm only a parent who has done the research. I wasn't paid by the bottomless coffers of the taxpayers, nor do I have anything to gain politically. However, I am a parent demanding that my elected board listens to their constituents and not politically motivated special interest groups. I've lost faith in Michigan's public educational institution due to the lies and deceptions perpetrated by the very people we elected to this once fine institution for nefarious reasons. I sincerely hope you vote down this questionable and inferior science standards, that we have the opportunity to create a better Michigan one pupil at a time. Thank you. Thank you for being there. Our next speaker is Senator Patrick Kolbeck, followed by Emily Polanski. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate this opportunity to testify in front of the board. Um, done a lot of homework on this for a while here, and just a little bit of background because it's not just a state senator. Um, I feel, uh, obviously, I think the state senator uh, background provides a little bit of insight that would uh, make some of my comments well qualified in the area of civics, I believe. Um, in regards to science, I have a master's degree and bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan. I've been a practicing aerospace engineer during my career including work on the International Space Station. So I feel fairly well qualified to discuss science and uh, engineering design aspects of the science standard. So 
In context of that background, I went off and provided a list of 15 re su suggested revisions in regards to the social study standards and seven suggested revisions in regards to the science standards. And uh, I have uh, legislators that have signed on, 17 other legislators signed on to the science standards, I mean to the social study standard revisions that I suggested, and uh, um, including the chair of the Senate Education Policy uh, um, Committee, on which I serve as well. Uh, and I also have uh, a total of four legislators who've co-signed on the science standards as well, including the chair of the Senate Education Policy on which I serve as um, so I um, So the comments that I've submitted, I think, are, uh, represent, I could have had more signatures with more time, but uh, you, uh, we all know that time is short on this. And so um, I would, uh, I understand that in regards to the social study standards, you've looked at a couple of the items that, are, that have been suggested in that as examples already. As an engineer, I like to provide not just, I'd like to be very detailed so you guys saw the whole matrix of what we're suggesting. It's not a broad-based context, it's a specific issue with specific resolution. Try to facilitate it to um, help make your job a little bit easier in that regard. Um, so I, I would press for, you know, um, an understanding of exactly which suggestions would be uh, accepted, which ones would not be accepted and the reasoning along with why each of those, uh, anything that you may not choose to pursue um, would not be accepted. So I, I was guided in the social study standards by, by three main, main considerations. First of all, accuracy. So when you're talking about democracy versus republic, I think that's a pretty clear example of being inaccurate with what we're instructing our kids. When it comes to political fairness, it gets into some difficult territory. I mean, I, I'm, I'm living and working in this area, I understand it. My goal is just to make sure that we're presiding and preventing, uh, presenting both sides of the story. So, for example, when we talk about progressivism, well, why aren't we talking about conservatism? Um, if we're talking about the Great Depression, the New, De uh, New Deal, why don't we talk about the depression that never was under Coolidge and Harding? So, I, all I'm looking for is, a, I, we're not looking for consensus. I just want folks that are able to um, uh, you achieve that consensus in the classroom where they're presented with both sides of the story and I think that's the purpose of education. Give these kids the tools that they need to make critical decisions on their own. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I will, I will get back to you. Thank you. Thanks. Our next speaker is Emily Polanski followed by Robbie Kramer. My name is Emily Polanski and I am president of the Network of Michigan Educators. We are a group of honored educators uh, including superintendents of the year, Michigan teachers of the year, national board certified educators. We've been coming pretty regularly to these meetings to share some success stories and today I'm here to share some successes from my science classroom at Novi High School but also to urge you to adopt the new Michigan science standards. In an art class, my daughter feels she is an artist. And in a science class, I want her to think she's a scientist. And these are what these new science standards do. They encourage kids to be part of the action. In preparation <coughs> for these potential science standards at Novi, we have been trying to incorporate the science and engineering practices. So if you'll look on the handout I provided, I've got some pictures of me trying to do this in my classroom. And um, it really begins with me posing a problem to my students. Each one of them in their small groups has to come up with a different design or plan to investigate this problem. They work together within a set of constraints, then they conduct that investigation. Afterwards, we use whiteboards to share out and discuss their results. This is a great opportunity for students to make claims and challenge each other to back up those claims with evidence and reasoning. And what I think is so important is after they've had this big class discussion, sharing things out, they then individually write. And that helps me know, have we actually improved outcomes using, using these new science standards? It also, and it also helps me know at an individual level, not just what groups of kids can do, but what does each child know. And I'm telling you, it has improved outcomes. These students understand science more deeply, and they are doing science. 
And I think about this because I am also a mom of a third, or I'm sorry, a first grader. Oh, she's a second grader. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps getting old. Yeah. And then of course I have a preschooler. And next year she goes into third grade. So I took a second to think about what will third grade look like for her if she is under our current standards or if she's under the new standards. So under the current standards, she is going to have to identify the force that pulls objects towards the earth. So identify gravity. Under the new standards, she would have to plan and conduct an investigation to provide evidence of the effects of balanced and unbalanced forces on the motion of the object. Let's pay attention to the verbs there. Do we want our kids identifying <coughs> or do we want them planning and conducting? For my daughters and my students, I want them to be doers, <coughs> builders, creators, designers, not labelers. And I think that's what, the decision that's here today. Do we want cooks that follow directions or do we want chefs that take their knowledge, bring it all together and create something new? I want my kids to be chefs. Please adopt these standards. Thank you, Emily, for being there. Thank you. Robbie Kramer is the next speaker, followed by Michelle Klein. Good afternoon. Good, afternoon. Good, afternoon. Good afternoon. I am so excited and a little nervous to be here this afternoon. This afternoon has been a long time coming. I'm Robbie Kramer. I'm the executive director of the Michigan Science Teachers Association. And you know, for several weeks now, MSTA leadership has been spent their time listening to the people of Michigan across our state ask questions express their views on the new proposed science standards at public comment sessions that were held by MDE. I personally attended seven of these sessions. Attendance ranged from groups of 15 to 100 people. The questions and the answers have been posted on the MDE website and I have encouraged my members and leaders to take a look at all of these perspectives. I believe it will be very helpful to answer questions from their own colleagues, from the parents of the children they are teaching, and from families within their communities to have that kind of a perspective. Because we're all going to be asked questions like this. And how do we answer for me, my brothers and sister-in-law sitting around the Thanksgiving table, how do I share this information with my family? In my role as the Michigan Science Teachers Association Executive Director, I listened to the people. I saw common emerging themes. The need for professional development for teachers and pre-service teachers and administrators assessment time frames for both implementation and assessment itself there were questions and concerns about engineering standards that's new to us k5 time for science instruction taking that time and how do we do that meaningfully the other questions included the middle school science standards as being grade band and not grade level and some thoughts about teacher credentialing. We're a science organization that provides a state conference, and we've done that now for 62 years in a row. And so our mission guides what MSTA will do. We have a different niche in what we provide. So we took those ideas and we developed strands for our teachers and administrators or conference attendees that they could go to several sessions in a row and look at, for example, elementary science from how do they teach it, incorporating it with picture books and with writing. Another session on how do you teach science and social studies together. So all of this, we are trying to find ways that we can help our teachers and administrators be able to do this. Yesterday I attended a conference with other science leaders. We all talked about next steps. 
in the afternoon, I met with the Michigan Conservation Clubs and they talked about their tracks magazines and how were they going to change these to make these resources for teachers work. We are eager to get started. The Michigan Science Teachers Association encourages the Michigan Board of Education to adopt the proposed Michigan Science Standards. MSTA will continue to offer active support in the implementation of these standards across our state. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi, for being here today. Michelle Klein is our next speaker, followed by Sandra Fisher. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for giving me some time to talk today. I have been in education for 30 years. I have just opened a nonprofit ed education um, organization in Wayne County. Um, in those 30 years, I've been 10 years as an elementary classroom teacher. I've spent 25 years as a math and science consultant, a national math and science consultant. And so I've been around all the different states, and I've taught in three different states. Michigan, um, when they first came out with their state standards, they, they, those standards were by far some of the best in the nation, and the test itself was amazing. When the test first came out, <coughs> the students had to do an investigation when they were in fifth grade, in eighth grade, I believe, and then once in high school, and then the test included looking at that investigation results and answering some questions. That test was one of the best in the nation. I traveled around during that time, saw a lot of <coughs> other states and their instructional practices, and it was great. When that piece was cut due to financial situations, which I understand, I think that hurt um, the science education in the state of Michigan. The next generation science standards and the science standards that are state science standards that are proposed today are great. They are excellent for elementary teachers in particular, and that's the this group I would like to speak about. The standards have integrated with them the math common core and the EL, ELA common core. And so when you're an elementary teacher, you have a lot to teach and it's set up, it's designed to help those teachers see connections across the content areas. That is a major bonus for our K-6 or K-5 teachers. The um, engineering practices are a major bonus for the state's focus on career and college readiness. For those students who may not want to go to a four-year college, those engineering practices are going to help our classroom teachers, K-12, design programs and activities and curriculum that support them going into a career directly out of high school where the current standards would not necessarily support that move. They are well documented and researched by um, people in the state of Michigan who I have studied under and worked with. And so um, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there that they are not Michigan um, designed. There are a lot of really smart, um, knowledgeable people and understanding education that have been a, had a finger in um, making those standards come to, to life. So I would be in support of the next generation <coughs> science standards, and it'll be my privilege to help make sure that K-12 educators can use those standards effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for being here. Our next speaker is Sandra Fisher, and I believe our final speaker is Tabitha Caboni, unless... We're, we're going together. Oh, okay. Does anyone else have a green form? Okay, and these are our final two speakers. Oh, so we'll be ready whenever you are. My name is Sandra Fisher. And I'm Tabitha Caboni. We're both from the Croswell-Lexington School District area, although my child is no longer in attendance there. And I don't really have anything prepared to speak. I wasn't expecting to talk, but I felt like as a parent, a mom, a veteran, neighbor, you need to know how the, t the school t treats parents that speak out or speak up against some of the things that are being taught. As a result, I have pulled my child from the school district because when I went there with questions, I was banned from the school. All property, <coughs> all school-sponsored events, and it had IE, way games, stuff. It, it, the whole thing was blown out of proportion. It was not physically aggressive, verbally aggressive. I was sitting there waiting patiently to speak to somebody when the superintendent just came out and opened the door and started screaming at me to get out. And then the next day, I was sent a letter from the school, restricted. They spent 11.89 to get this to me the next day. 
that I'm not allowed on the property. And then they said, as a result of my conduct, because I was confrontational and disorderly, I wasn't the one that was confrontational and disorderly. I was there waiting to ask questions. I had some questions. And as far as Common Core, my concern, not only with the math, the science, my biggest issue was with the, the social studies. My daughter came home last year when she was in seventh grade and had six chapters on Islam, one chapter on Christianity. I don't, if they want to teach the Islam, it needs to be equal and balanced. Not six weeks on one and one day on another. And if you're going to teach the five pillars of Islam, then you need to teach the Ten Commandments. My, my, uh, what I know is, is, is separation of church and state. Neither one of them should be taught. If you can teach the geography, the history, without teaching the religion. And that's what it's going into. And... Tabitha here is now, she still has a child in Croslex, and she was just sent a letter yesterday from the superintendent and gave her two choices. My choices were one, either conform, conform to Common Core and everything, which includes, um, and basically saying I don't have the right to opt out or refuse standardized testing Islam. My only option according to the school is to opt out of health or remove my child from public schools. And this school is notorious for, they don't care about student retainment. They, they're the biggest school in San Alec County. And they, what I was told was, your child leaves, we've got five more on a waiting list. So now I drive my child a half hour away to a, a charter school to, because one, I'm banned. How am I gonna let my child go to a school if I'm not allowed on the property? I'm the only one available to pick her up if she's sick, if she gets hurt, needs something and I'm not allowed on the property. What about parent conferences? You know, and, and, and I can't even talk to anybody. I can't go to the school board meeting because they barred me from it. I, I have no one to speak to. Nobody will listen to me. Nobody will return my calls or my emails. Therefore, I had, to, I had no choice but to pull her from the school. There was a bullying issue that was going ongoing prior to that. And I think they used that. I think the bottom line was they wanted me gone because I had spoke up about the common core issues that I had, you know, issues with, and they just wanted me gone, and they used the bullying issue that I was there for because my child was being bullied and didn't even want to hear it and just sent me out. So I just wanted you to know this is how this school district treats parents when you go there with a concern. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here and sharing. Our final speaker is Jen Arnswald. Do I have all the forms? Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Superintendent Winston and the members of the school board for the opportunity to share some of the things that we're working with the Michigan Science Teachers Association. Um, I'm Jen Arnswald. I'm the president-elect of the Michigan Science Teachers Association. Uh, for the past four years, I was working at Ken ISD as the science education consultant, and now I'm at Ionia Public Schools. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about what we have going this year to support science teachers, um, hopefully if the proposed standards are adopted this afternoon. This year we're gonna have our annual conferences in Lansing and the theme is science, what a capital idea. So, you know, we're really ready to start going forward. Um, some of the things that we'll have going on is we're happy to announce that Dr. Joseph Krejcik will be our keynote um, and he will be sharing with us um, ideas for formative assessment in the science classroom because we know it's a high effect strategy for, you know, helping our students understand where they're at and move forward. Also at the conference, we're going to have several st strands to meet the needs of our various members. Uh, the Michigan Create for STEM, or the MSU Create for STEM Institute is going to be offering sessions on three-dimensional learning and assessment of the new Michigan science standards. The Michigan Science Educational Leadership Association will be offering uh, sessions to provide and support the individuals that are leading the implementation in buildings and also at the county level. Um, we also have the Michigan Math and Science Centers who have been working with the Next Gen Science Exemplars program throughout the state, getting facilitators trained. We've already had six days of training and lots of them are Saturdays. We have another Saturday coming up this weekend for that. Um, and they'll be promoting those things and sharing the, the, um, the resources with our teachers in their sessions. Um, in addition to this, we know that there's all sorts of teachers that are part of the Science Association, so we'll have resources and topics for administrators, teachers, higher ed faculty, pre-service teachers, students come to our conference also. We, uh, we had some present at the conference. 
and also some scientists sharing the knowledge with our teachers to help them get ready to implement the new standards. Um, currently, we are exploring partnerships with the Michigan Secondary and Elementary Principals Association to make sure that we are helping them support their administrators and their professional organizations, and also with the Michigan Association of Curriculum or Supervision and Curriculum Development um, to be able to forge those bonds between all of our professional organizations to support this, um, what we're working on. <laughs> Uh, also, one thing that we'll be having at our new or at the conference is a pre-conference for administrators, and with that, we're working with those other organizations to make sure we meet the needs of their uh, members. And we'll have Peter McLaren here. He was the past, or the past state science supervisor from Rhode Island, and they have implemented these standards for a couple years. And now he is the director of state and district support at Achieve. So he has offered to come here and share his wisdom and stories about the you know the challenges and opportunities of the new science standards. Um, well, thank you for uh, letting me, or thank you for supporting science education in Michigan. And as a parent, I have a four and six-year-old, so similar to your stories, I am very excited that they'll have the opportunity to learn with these new standards. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for everyone who made public comment for taking the time to be here and to share with us. We're going to move on to introduction of new MDE employees. Uh, so I'll start with Kyle. Susan? I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Redding. Can you please talk a little bit about your job? Um, my name is Beth Redding. I'm with the Office of Great Start and um, the Special Education Preschool Departments. I support the consultants in pretty much every aspect of their job. I help them with the different um, computer programs that they have to do. I run reports for them. And Thank you very much, and welcome to the new employees. Glad to have you. I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of October 13th, 2015. So moved. It's been moved supported. and supported. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed the same. Motion carries. President's report, please. I'll be very brief so we can get to important items, including the Detroit Schools Plan that the Governor, I hope, is introducing um, even maybe today and the importance of that and advancing that. Um, we touched on, uh, I did participate in the sharing of additional information with Michigan State University, Michigan Children's Study on bullying. I think many of us who've been eager to improve on that, our bullying situation, our schools, with our model policy in 2006, with legislation finally in 2011, you know, may have been feeling that we had uh, our job was done, but obviously we still have higher than the norm incidents of students reporting bullying. We know how damaging any of those kids, and we know any of those kids know how really damaging, even life threatening, like kids choose suicide. It can be. Um, it certainly doesn't create an environment which can turn. So. Um, we have, uh, I hope, more work to do to create a culture in every school that doesn't, willing doesn't happen. And you know, I know, mercifully, my own kids are in a, uh, went through a school, one's still there, where that's the culture. It just doesn't happen because they work together, the kids and the faculty on ensuring that. And there are other schools that, for whatever reason, haven't yet um, felt it's possible and or felt this is just kids being kids. And that is not an attitude that's going to lead you to a path where you say, no, we're going to create a culture that it just doesn't happen and the kids are bought in and we're all bought in. So we need to identify the next steps to continue to make uh, our schools the place where all kids are appreciated and thrive, whether they may be, whatever their gender, their identity, whatever their ethnicity, a lot of the information, the reports suggest, you know, it is the other, it is the person who's different, uh, the person with um, a different gender representation, a different ethnicity, a different religion. Uh, a different body type, and that we need to send a message that we lift up and appreciate all of our people, and we want them to thrive in Michigan and learn in our schools. So, um, 
we we are going to be you know, talk before about a group of stakeholders for a year has been developing a set of recommendations for how we can increase post-secondary credential attainment of all forms, how we can set and help Michigan reach a goal of 60% of our people uh, with some form of valuable post-secondary degree, certificate, workforce credential. We're at 46. We're not near the top 10 states. We want to get into the top 10 states and the people prepared with the uh, credentials that allow them to navigate in the economy, them to be the job creators, them to have a good job, keep a good job, and provide a decent standard of living. So those recommendations, I've shared those with you, uh, coming from stakeholders in higher ed, this department, uh, business leaders, labor leaders, uh, administration. We're going to release publicly the first week of December. Um, within it are some very uh, important sets of recommendations that touch the kind of K-12 post-secondary interface, including how we enhance guidance, counseling, both capacity and effectiveness to navigate those next steps how we ensure readiness for post-secondary, and how we expand the numbers dramatically of young people who are earning uh, post-secondary credits and credentials while they're in high school, which is a, whether it's early college, middle college, dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment, good CTE programs that map for certificate learning. <coughs> we need more of all, it works for at-risk kids, it works for kids who are uh, high flyers already academically, uh, and that's a piece of the agenda. So. I hope there's uh, sharing all that as part of our top ten discussions and we can make some additional headway as a state on this important goal of, because the high school diploma <laughs> doesn't get you success in today's economy. Everyone needs some form of post-secondary credential uh, to, to succeed and we need to provide it. Uh, and these recommendations are also very attentive. Some I participated, as some of uh, others of you did, in the Center for Michigan's latest community conversations about can people afford college? How do we help more people get to college and jobs? Uh, those, um, their uh, listening to people suggests better guidance, better counseling, better financial aid to support post-secondary. All of those are things that we're going to be recommending in this work. Um, finally, I was hoping maybe briefly Eileen or Michelle could just speak generally. The, you mentioned the, the Lieutenant Governor's um, Special Commission on um, uh, Special Education. Since it's on such a tight time frame, I know we'll want to hear back once it's done its work, but so that this board and people appreciate what is the sort of charge or expectation for that work. I'm delighted that uh, you all have taken that on. I'm delighted with Lieutenant Governor's providing some leadership on how do we improve our special education policy practice. I mean, he was here uh, a couple of months ago, so. Can you give us any just general sense of what the charge of that group is and what kind of things you might be looking to accomplish or do in that over the next couple months? I understand it's a quick thing. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Michelle has been to two meetings. I've only been on the phone for one, but again, the board, because it's so recent, but there are people here who won't know this. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor led a listening tour around the state. He has a daughter who's autistic. And with the uh, comments that came out of the um, rules, the, uh, the rule promulgation that the department attempted to do about a year ago, uh, the concerns that the that parents voiced, uh, he decided to try and collect enough information to give us a better basis for overhauling whatever was wrong. And uh, the presentation he made here was thoughtful, um, far-reaching, uh, and it's true that um, this area has not been visited or revised substantially with the advent of uh, uh, consumer information so readily available on the internet, and the frustration level of parents is extremely high. So, uh, and, and teachers are frustrated too because uh, the, the training that they need apparently may be available in other states. We're not doing some things here that other states are doing better. So it's a question of how can we pull all those pieces together and come up with something that works. Yeah, yeah and um, I, I was able to go around with the Lieutenant Governor to most of the stops on the listening tour and um, so what he presented was really a true representation of some of the things that we heard, plus he had a survey. And so the, the charge is based on some of those priority issues that came out and he spoke to all of us about. Now we're going to be meeting every Tuesday. Um, through December 22nd. Yeah, until it's December 22nd. So it's a pretty <laughs> short time frame. Um, so, but, you know, there are a number of things we want to look at and, and he spoke to and one is how to maybe, um, the rules promulgation, you know, um, revision process, um, 
you know, are there are there things that we can do to um, do more outreach or be more inclusive? You know, <coughs> uh, restraint, seclusion is an important issue. Looking at ways to resolve disputes that parents may have with a district in a more um, student-focused um, uh, way, in a way that's not as contentious or costly or involve as many lawyers. No offense against lawyers, but. Um, but something that's uh, and, and ultimately provides services. So those are some of the main topics that are coming up, and it's a very diverse group in the room. Um, and uh, so it's it's very uh, it's exciting. I'm hopeful. I just hope we can uh, present something soon. Um, and and Terry Chapman being there too is really wonderful. She's uh, she's really <coughs> providing a lot of information and um, uh, and doing a great job too. So. So I, I imagine at some point this group will have recommendations yes. for the superintendent with his authority, the board for a policy, other right. practice in the field, and obviously whenever is right, right. Come, back, come and share those. And, th and there's a number of state legislators who are on both Democrat and Republican who care a lot about these issues. So, it's, okay. so thank you. Okay, moving on to the superintendent's report. As you know, we're going through a process of developing recommendations for the board to consider on becoming a top 10 state <coughs> in 10 years. As you know, we had over 30 people come present to you. Over 765 people filled out surveys. I had five minute meetings with people who wanted to come see me. We had over 4,200 uh, uh, recommendations that were made. And we're taking all of that, but we're also looking at the research of what states have been successful in other nations that have been successful in improving uh, their educational systems. And we're working through that process uh, to come up with the recommendations along with the uh, standards and the way that we will measure those standards. So <laughs> we're a little behind because of what happened in the last couple of weeks, but we'll get back on track and continue to work with the board and the constituent groups out there. Uh, to move forward on becoming a top 10 state. Tied closely to that are three committees that have been meeting. Kyle has been leading the committee on looking at school finances uh, and all, all the issues around school funding. Norma Jean has been leading the one on accountability, looking at how we're going to hold ourselves and our school districts accountable. And Vanessa has been looking at assessment, as we mentioned earlier, what's needed in the classroom, what a school district needs, what's the state needs, how can we do all that in a systematic way that makes sense? And so all of that will help inform becoming a top 10 state as well. And just very briefly, I want to say thank you to everyone for your support over the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's been a tough time, but thank you. So report of T Michigan Teacher of the Year. Rick Joseph, please. I have to say that um, as we enter into the second quarter of the year in Michigan, thank you. Um, I've been very fortunate because I have a co-teacher in my classroom, Tori Howe, who is getting settled into their, the routine, the processes of um, what we do and how we do it, which is enabling me to um, go about the state more than before um, to offer professional learning to teachers and to interact with students in meaningful ways, which is very exciting to me because I feel like that's certainly the key, the key work of, um, of the Michigan Teacher of the Year. So um, I continue to talk about the importance of the, the official book of the Michigan Teacher of the Year, The Junkyard Wonders, and you can see, I don't know if you know that gentleman on the right side of the screen um, holding up the book, but I've been looking at to a variety of, of um, people throughout the state as I, as I interact um, with a, a number of people from young children all the way through um, adults. Um, at DeWitt High School, just north of Lansing here, they have a, a, an amazing um, experience there for students. Um, there's a room called the Idea Hive, and the Idea Hive is basically um, not showing up on the screen, although it should. <laughs> um, but I can tell you about it nevertheless. Basically, the, the, there's a drama teacher there named um, his name is Jeff Crowley, and along with Jason LaFay, who's an English teacher, the two of them have created a space that's very deinstitutionalized, and so it's very, very friendly for students to go in and not only have class, but, but um, feel comfortable in their learning experiences. And I was able to lead conversations with high school students at DeWitt, and they talked about 
things that they celebrate and things that they appreciate about their school, but also some challenges that they face and some um, suggestions that they had for areas of improvement. And we even did a role play in which one student um, played himself, and I played the role of the student's father, and I was asking him, um, you know, why he would make certain decisions to um, pursue the arts, because he was very into the arts, he was very into the performing arts, and at the end of the, in the end of this role play, he simply said, Dad, trust me, just trust me. So that really exemplified the importance of enabling kids to find their voice, and um, that experience, not only working with kids and facilitating discussions with these kids, but also touring the high school was a very meaningful experience. Um, I did have the pleasure of working with a gentleman that I refer to as the fixer, and those of you who work here at the department know um, Mr. Benjamin Williams because Ben um, <laughs> enabled me to spend three, um, one, he spent three visits in one day on the 22nd of October um, with three different legislators, and I certainly couldn't have, could not have done this without Ben and without all of his dedication and hard work because one of the considerations that I have as Michigan Teacher of the Year is to make sure that my presence is meaningful and that it's relevant because I don't want to be just a figurehead. I don't want to be um, just somebody who shows up and conducts a dog and pony show and sits at the table. Um, I, I really want to have some kind of an impact. So I met with Mike Creedy. Mike McCready is a Republican representative who represents the district where my school is located in, in Bloomfield Hills. And so Mike is used to going out to schools in March and um, reading to kids for National, National Reading Month, like what you, say, what you see here. I was able to sit with him, um, again, thanks to Ben's support, and, and we talked about upcoming legislation. And, and he was very happy to meet with me. And he hadn't met with a Teacher of the Year um, before. So he was um, pleased that I had taken the time, and, and I was pleased to have had the opportunity to meet with him and talk about what his issues were um, in regard to, to public education. Senator Marty Nolenberg, as many of you know, is a Republican senator who not only represents the district where I teach, but he also represents the district where I live in Royal Oak. And Marty was thrilled that I was there as well, and he, had it, he really essentially extended an invitation to all of you around this table and said, please come and talk to me. Please come and spend some time with me. What are you thinking about? What's going on? What's on your mind? Um, and so he, and he too was pleased that, that I had taken the time, thanks to Ben, to get into his office and talk about what he'd done. He, Marty actually introduced some legislation um, to enable us to start school in August, which we had done for many, many years in Michigan. But he believes, as many teachers and many um, parents and community members also, also believe, that it would behoove us to begin the year in August and then end a little bit earlier in the springtime for a multitude of reasons. Um, and of course there are a lot of pending, there's a lot of important pending legislation, the third grade retention bill, etc., that a lot of people are paying attention to. And as a member of the Senate Education Committee, Marty is very interested in, in public education policy, as we all are. Um, I met with Jim Townsend, who's a Democrat. He's a um, representative from Royal Oak, Michigan, where I live. And Jim is the kind of guy that um, just, he said, I, I believe that we should just, as legislators, we should just let teachers do their job. We need to just get out of the way. And so that was a message that certainly resonated with me and with, with a lot of my colleagues. Um, but Jim um, was, was very pleased to have the opportunity, again, to sit down and talk with me. And he, too, would, would welcome more members of, of our State Board of Ed and more members of our department to come and spend some time with him. Let, them know, let him know what's on, um, what's on our minds and what are we thinking about. And I think we, we have so much more in common legislatively than we realize with our, um, our colleagues um, in, in our state capital. Um, I was able to go a few weeks ago to Deerfield Elementary School, which is an elementary school in Avondale. And a colleague of mine named Mary Schultz um, is a fifth grade teacher there, and I was able to read The Junkyard Wonders by Patricia Polacco, the, the Michigan Teacher of the Year's book, and share that message with three different classrooms and then lead a discussion and um, an exercise using a three-way Venn diagram, which talked about the interrelationship of three key principles, which are core principles at Deerfield. Courage, kindness, and um, their last one, which is uh, their, um, slipping my mind, courage, kindness, and um, innovation. And so the, these are traits that which, were, which are, are evident in, in the main character in this book, and then we articulated those um, in our subsequent discussions after reading this book. I was also <coughs> able to go to Hamtramck High School. Um, a colleague of mine, Terry George, is the principal at Hamtramck High School. And on last Tuesday, when we had professional development days here across the state, I was able to lead three different professional development sessions with 
with those teachers across the content area because we talked about literacy in the content area and the ways in which um, students not only um, need to learn how to read particular texts at the middle and high school level, but they need to have um, a mentor in the, teach, in, in the teacher, in the classroom teacher. So the teacher has to be able to articulate not only what the content is, but how to most meaningfully access the content. And so um, working with colleagues, we read articles, we brainstormed approaches, and, and we had a very um, meaningful conversation at Hamtramck High School. And there is Terry, the principal, um, again with the, the, um, a copy of the Junkyard Wonders. And so an interesting gentleman that I met to conclude this afternoon was a gentleman named Ahmed. He was a translator for the United States Army in Baghdad, Iraq, back in 2003 when the United States entered that country. And then he talked about how um, he quickly realized that he needed to leave the country in order to find safe haven in the United States. And he is um, exceptionally grateful for the opportunity to not only be in the United States, uh, but to work uh, in Hamtramck Public Schools. And so I've, I've done a lot, of, a lot of different things. It's been very ex exciting, very interesting, and I look forward to continue um, to engage in a lot of different activities around the state. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, for the report. Appreciate it. Next item on today's agenda is discussion and approval uh, of the Michigan Science Standards. The presentation will provide an overview of the results of the public information sessions and public comment feedback for the proposed standards. We'll also be making a request for you to vote on the standards. Today, November 10th, is World Science Day, held annually to raise the awareness of the benefits of science worldwide. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization works with different people, government agencies, and organizations to promote World Science Day each year. The celebration includes things like open day to highlight science, important role in peace and development, classrooms, discussions to emphasize how science and technologies affect daily lives, arrange science museum visits, and visits to local schools on career day in order to talk about science and science presentations. I think it's appropriate to be talking about this important topic on science, uh, state, uh, science Day to publicly affirm our commitment to increase support for standards and the initiate scientific initiatives that help society as well as launch new science policy together with scientific institutions, civil society, universities, and schools. So we're going to have a presentation by Norma Jean Sass, Deputy Superintendent of Educational Services, Linda Forward, Director of Educational Improvement and Innovation, and Stephen Best, Assistant Director of Education Improvement and Innovation. I guess he's promoted earlier, or he was the tech guy. <laughs> right. Right. So we moved him up. All right. He did a lot over lunch. <laughs> Happy World Science Day, everyone. Um, this is an exciting day to, um, after years of a lot of people's uh, work and input, to be able to come to the board and present science standards. Take it away. So thank you, Norma Jean. Uh, this has indeed been a long time and a lot of work. And before we begin this, I do want to once again call out those who are close within the department circles that have had a role in this and without whom we would not be here. Certainly Greg Dion, Ruth Ann Hodges, Megan Schrauben from our uh, unit and curriculum and instruction. Sue Coderre, who led the first round of this work for over two years and did phenomenal work and is well appreciated across the country for her efforts across these standards and some of the work there. And Steve Best, who you all know because of the whole work that he's been doing on helping educate all of us around science standards for the last couple of years. So all of them, I just my thanks. Um, the, the, the slides are, the first part of the slides are not new, but just to take you back to what we were trying to do is get quality science instruction into the classroom, and one piece of that is quality science standards, and so that's the part we're going to talk about today. Certainly going along with that, you will find implementation issues around um, uh, assessments and uh, what the curriculum might be, all of those kinds of things. And once again, I want to remind you that we have conflated issues as we've gone through this because we've been doing a general instructional model for everybody and in, do, in so doing we have brought together science, uh, the standards, the curriculum and the instruction and today we are talking just about the standards. That's our goal for today. Um, the current standards, the ones that are in effect right now, were approved in, in 2005 and there are two sets of them, much like the social studies standards, the K-7 grade level content expectations and the high school content level. 
content expectations. Those, once they were adopted, were followed by companion documents and topic-based mapping tools for support. That is the sort of work that the department does in order to provide base information to the field in order to go about implementing and developing a curriculum and instructional models. Our proposed standards um, are performance expectations for students in grades, grades K through 12. So just what it is that we would like students to be able to know how to do and be able to demonstrate that. We are coding the standards then to assessments and we'll provide separate guidance documents to address details and connections for educators, but those are separate and you're not being asked to propose or to approve those standards. Those items, just the standards. So, public information and feedback. Once again, we were out to over 12 sites across the state where over 600 people were present to provide information and feedback. And we also presented at uh, the uh, various conferences across the state, including um, the school improvement I'm sorry, the School Improvement Framework Network, as well as um, the DAS conferences that took place across the state. We've met with more than 46 legislators and the governor's office regarding the standards, their content, and their development. And we have received over 800 survey responses to the public survey documents. Types of feedback. Once again, I would remind you that 80% um, is, the, is the bar at the top. And so... Um, around 78% of the public uh, feedback tells us that they are in a, they approve the, they support the standards, uh, support their adoption. Uh, around 40% have offered assistance, and we have general comments at around 10%. Questions about implementation was one of the big factors again, and general standards concerns uh, are around 7%. And you will note the specific standards concerns was so small it does not show up on the graph, although the input is there. So very few. This graph is um, familiar to you now and is the same as what we talked about this morning. And I'm going to cut it short there, but just to remind you that we have a variety of concerns and supports expressed <laughs> and a process for dealing for each one of them. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Steve and have him share with you what um, themes were and the comments that we did get and uh, what some of the actions were as a result of that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, as mentioned, there were, there were 800 responses to our public survey, which was immense. Um, to date, we have not had that many responses on any standards effort whatsoever. The, this goes way above and beyond anything we've had. And so we, we truly did hear from people in the state. We heard from a variety of uh, people in these efforts, not only during um, the public information sessions, but through the survey and through a variety of, of efforts. When looking at the feedback that we have, and, and we have literally 93 pages of it in a really, really small <laughs> font. So it's a lot of feedback when you look at 800 responses. When looking through all of the details, some themes emerge. One of the themes is around <coughs> the standards themselves, what they are, what, what the content is, um, how these things are placed. Another is around the role of standards. There were a lot of comments about that, which get to the, the point that uh, Linda had addressed earlier, which is a lot of misunderstanding about um, the difference between standards, curriculum, and instruction. And then a lot of implementation questions on a variety of topics, including assessment, teacher learning, and instructional practices. We'd like to go into a few of these in some detail just so you can get a sense of the kinds of comments and feedback that did come through. First, with respect to the standards themselves, when we looked at the standards um, and looked at the feedback around what people were saying specifically about the standards documents and about the standards. There were a lot of uh, concerns that were raised. Some of the concerns had to do with changes in content from existing uh, grade level or band, primarily at the middle grades. The fact that we are going from a transition of having standards at every grade level through grade seven and then high school to now having a grade band in grades six through eight. That's a question that comes up. There are some responses we have for that. Um, an additional concern is a misunderstanding of the connection between the next generation science standards uh, format and resources and 
uh, what are proposed as the Michigan science standards, recognizing that these are the performance expectations pulled out and that we specifically did that so that we get the flexibility to be able to address other issues in time through guidance without having to go through an adoption process anytime we wish to make those issues. Finally, another concern that was raised is a misunderstanding of the role of guidance to the actual standards. What, what guidance really does. In terms of some responses for this, a few things come up. First of all, um, we need to be able to focus on modifying instruction uh, to standards uh, documents and address these in guidance and in the rollout. Basically looking at this differentiation between the standards, the curriculum, and instruction. What they are, what each does to support each other, but recognizing the fact that one cannot be assumed to be the other. Another aspect of this is to develop crosswalks and training supports for implementation with the current standards. This is always a process of any standards transition where you're looking for from moving from the existing into the new, giving teachers a pathway to understand how some of what they have now can be leveraged and utilized to be able to address the new standards. A second theme that came out, as I mentioned, is the role of standards. In looking at some of the concerns that were brought up around this, there was, again, a lot of confusion about the role of curriculum, standards, and instruction. There were misconceptions about the, who has what role between the state and local school districts with regard to these items. Additionally, there was concern about how the standards will impact state policies that are tied to statewide assessments, such as the M-STEP. Again, in looking at ways to be able to address all of these efforts, because these are not simply things that just alone get addressed in the standards, but get addressed over time because there are obviously either concerns or misconceptions that educators and others in the state have about moving forward. So part of this is to develop a renewed focus on conveying this role of standards, curriculum, and instruction. We've heard from a variety of groups. Yesterday I was meeting with the science educators who were addressing exactly this consideration of the challenge in many districts where there is greater and greater um, misunderstanding about the difference between all of these pieces, and especially so in the public. We need to have a renewed communication effort around these uh, differences. Likewise, part of our response is to stress um, in our communication how the state and local policies are based um, on the standards and how these will be implemented to differentiate what schools do, what the state does, and what the interplay of these things is. The last theme in the comments that came out is around implementation. Implementation concerns hit a variety of topics, as I mentioned, including assessment, teacher learning, and instructional practices. Some of the concerns that are raised are around issues of timing and implementation, and what this schedule may mean, especially for assessment. There were significant concerns about the needs for professional development and how this will be funded, as well as questions about support for resources, models, and appropriate instructional practices. In terms of a response, as we've discussed in many of our sessions, and in fact, as you know, we visited with you five times to address these implementation concerns. Um, and part of what we've looked at is a five to seven year implementation plan. Part of this includes a, planned roll, uh, a set of planned rollout activities that would work with partner organizations, including our higher education institutions, Michigan Science Teachers Association, uh, groups like GELN, the Michigan Math and Science Centers, for whom I mean, they are such a critical piece of the implementation efforts that will go on for this. They are all critical partners in this process. We've worked with them all along the way. We will continue to do so and support their efforts um, to be able to support the needs <coughs> of educators and students. Another part of this is really 
focusing on a plan for teacher learning and classroom implementation that addresses content practices and transitions over time. We have a number of ideas. There are a number of aspects of this that, that we have been working on for some time. As I mentioned yesterday, the meeting that we had with the science leaders around the state was focusing on these kinds of issues. But this will be something that is also modified and amended over time as we see what issues arise within the community of educators. As mentioned, we did have 800 responses in the public comment. We wanted to give you a sense of what the breakout for this looks like. The larger pie graph on the right shows the breakout by a variety of different groups here. And as you can see, nearly half of all of the respondents were teachers. We had a number of other areas represented. Uh, as you saw with social studies, uh, people identified with just one, so we know that we have many teachers and teacher educators who also are parents, for instance. Among the teachers, when we looked at the level of experience, as you can see, we had responses largely from some of our more experienced teachers in the field. We asked educators about the standards, first of all, to see whether they thought they were logical and in, uh, easy to use. The circle graph or the pie graph on the right um, addresses the responses that we had here. As you can see, a large portion, over one quarter of the respondents in the in the dark gray, um, completely skipped this question. This is not because, or we assume this is not because um, of some discontent with the standards, but likely because we had a number of respondents say they were not familiar with the actual standards document. They were interested in the ideas around science and science instruction, but had not gone through that document, which is fine. We recognize that's going to be the case. This shows up in some of the other responses here. We asked whether the standards were clearly written and easy to understand. As you can see, the majority agree, or in the light blue above it, strongly agree. The, those that did not respond are on the right of that graph. We also asked about the specificity for local use, whether the standards could be used to help local districts determine curriculum, instruction, and assessment um, activities. And again, strong agreement across the board. We then asked, edu we asked everyone about uh, standards use and appropriateness. We first asked um, about the focus on content and practices that are most important to learn. Did these standards reflect that? And people agreed or strongly agreed with this, as you can see. Over half uh, fit in that category. Again, a large portion, one-sixth of the group, or 17%, we're not familiar enough to even respond to this, so the pie graph looks a little distorted, but we wanted to make sure that you saw all of the data that was present here. We asked whether these standards are measurable and accessible at these uh, local and at the state level. At the local level, you see this in the dark blue on the, on the uh, bar graph in the upper right. In the light blue is at the state level educators recognizing that there may be some a little more challenge to addressing some of those components largely because we're looking at practices um, in the new standards another question focuses on support uh, whether the standards support development for career and college readiness this was an overwhelming positive response as you can see here again on the right we've included those that did not actually respond about the standards so that you can just see what the numbers are. But when looking at the agree to neutral or disagree, it's a strong recommendation for these standards. We asked about some of the details of the standards, whether the standards uh, allow people to be better prepared when focusing on those practices. Again, we see strong agreement with nearly a sixth of the individuals not responding or not familiar enough. We asked people about whether there was a coherent K-12 progression, which is actually one of the critical uh, pieces that has been identified 
by a number of groups about our existing standards, including the response from the Fordham uh, Institute. When you look at the response here, again, it is overwhelming that a K-12 progression of learning topics is developed over time through the standards. We also asked about opportunities for cross-disciplinary integration, those connections to mathematics and language arts. And again, this was such a strong, overwhelming agreement that the new standards provide for these opportunities. We looked at some issues around instruction and around the research base with this. We first asked people if they were familiar with the K-12 framework for science education, which again, we've introduced to you before as a foundational piece for these standards. Over half said they uh, were indeed familiar, um, with nearly a third saying they were somewhat familiar and about a fifth saying they were not familiar with this document. We asked if the standards provide a clear and coherent vision um, that is aligned with this framework. And again, the majority agreed with this. We also asked educators in particular if they are already implementing uh, aspects of the standards. We had a number of educators who said they were fully implementing now and a larger number that said they were partially implementing, wanting to move forward on these standards. There is still a large number who have not yet moved in this direction waiting for your direction on the standards. We finally asked about implementation priorities. I've grouped these by color so that you can see, given that we have a lot of responses, um, we asked educators to pick the three main priorities. Those that are in the various yellow to orange colors are all focusing on professional development, whether it be about content, pedagogy, or the standards updates. Those that are in green are focusing on resources, including text, lab supplies, instructional technology, and other materials. Those in blue recognize that there are policy challenges within their local districts or at the state level, and so they recognize the need for planning time and administrative support in their buildings. We also had a number of other issues, including teacher placement and certification, parent understanding, and policies that some, uh, in some way impact science instruction, such as educator evaluation. When looking at implementation of this, we wanted to be able to show you this not only for um, the five to seven years that we've addressed with you earlier, but what this would look like for the rest of this school year. If the standards are adopted here in the department, we would begin our transition plan, which includes developing guidance on implementation needs, uh, working between offices to address policy changes and funding, collaborating with those partner organizations that I mentioned before, as well as a number of rollout sessions, conference presentations, and webinars to be able to introduce the public to the standards and all of the nuances of those standards. We also recognize that local districts will be engaged in this process too, reviewing the standards and looking to look at their own resources as well as develop their plans for implementation starting in the next school year. You have seen a number of the pieces that we've addressed here before in our implementation plans. They range from considerations for teachers which include the review of standards and incorporating practices. For school districts, in terms of addressing K-5 science issues, reviewing the standards or uh, restructuring their secondary classes. Here in the department, modifying certification requirements and guidance. And among those teacher preparation organizations from whom you've heard some today, incorporating engineering changing some of their methods, courses, and restructuring elementary education. It will be a long process, but it is a process we need to be able to take for the future of our children, for Emily's children, yes. for her kids in her class, for, for my children, for all of ours. This is the path that we need to take moving forward. Thank you. Is there a motion? I'll huh? make a motion. To approve. It's been moved and supported. Now discussion. John? Um, very much appreciate all the hard work from everybody on this and 
appreciate the process, too, of the inclusive nature. Uh, I certainly am encouraging my colleagues to support these standards. Uh, let me just briefly say why. Um, I think we heard pretty clearly today, particularly from our science educators, that these standards really are about helping our young people have the facility and the engagement and the understanding of the doing of science and how it can be applied and how you can uh, do things like engineering and how it can be exciting and how can you find your life and work in science. Uh, wouldn't it be great, how can you be the chef versus the cook of science? Mm -hmm. um, that was a great example. We should, I'm excited about sending a message that we want to be the science state. We want our kids in science careers. Michigan should be. We have the ability to be the science and engineering leader as a state, and this will help send that message. I appreciate that. Um, also, we heard these very rigorous and more focused standards were developed with the leadership of our Michigan educators and higher educators. I mean, we are the national leaders in science education and shaped these standards. But we certainly are, so they're developed with strong leadership from Michigan. But also, they're decided in Michigan. I mean, we get to decide, we do, whether we want to embrace these really good <coughs> standards that help our kids learn and get excited about science. It's our decision. Um, we also, when we make these decisions, and part of why we update these science standards, we, we are incorporating new discovery about how the world works. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when the plate tectonics as an explanation for what was going on and continents moving was a new discovery. And now we know that that's what's at work. So these standards incorporate new scientifically demonstrated understandings of what's going on in the world. So we should be updating our science to reflect that. Um, and I'm excited about us being a state that helps our young people solve the problems of the future uh, and have the ability to do that. Uh, I'm eager for you all to uh, voice your, um, I hope, support, but I'm also particularly would love to hear from our Teacher of the Year, too, about this topic, because that's why he or she is here with us, to help us understand and make good decisions. Um, so thank you very much for all the hard work developing. Richard? Or uh, Rick? Rick? Um, to your point, John, I, I appreciate the opportunity to weigh in. I think you guys did an outstanding job trying to enable the general public, but also educators specifically, to appreciate the difference between the role of standards, curriculum, and instruction. It's so critical that we all understand that these are standards. This is not what we'll be doing on a daily basis as educators in classrooms. The standards inform practice. Standards inform curriculum. Educators local at the local level ultimately decide what the curriculum will be, and they ultimately decide how that curriculum will be implemented on a daily basis, and that's our role as professionals, without question. So it's critically important that we remember that, and I appreciate the fact that this is a multi-tiered um, implementation process so that there's a there's a heavy emphasis on professional development professional learning so that teachers feel supported and nurtured throughout the entire process and the parents and community members also understand that with a phased rollout that people will really be able to understand what it means to do science not just to sit in a classroom and open a textbook but as Emily so beautifully referenced and as John, you reiterated the importance of enabling kids to be creators, enable kid, you know, students to be, to be chefs and to understand the, the creative aspect of science and they don't simply repeat steps or they don't simply um, repeat what the teacher has told them. They don't regurgitate information back onto a page, but they interact with the science and they lit it and they breathe it. And this is what these standards enable us to do. And so I highly endorsed the, the, the support of these. Sandra and then I, Kathleen and Eileen. Uh, I, I really appreciate that feedback um, from our Teacher of the Year, and I also want to say how much I appreciate the fact that the science teachers have been coming to this meeting for well over a year now, <laughs> encouraging us constantly, please, 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 um, let's move this process forward. And it, it took a long time, as it should, because change is not easy, and uh, it takes a long time to get to, to make sure, and nothing's ever going to be perfect, but, you know, you can't... Um, you can't throw good out in, in favor of perfect. So um, I, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate this, um, the science teachers who have been so encouraging over the last year to two years um, and, and recognize that there are concerns and um, it's, that, that's legitimate because, like I said, change is not easy. But we had a presentation earlier today, too, with MSTEP. And I think um, the numbers for science 
reflect the fact that what we're doing today may not be working as well as we'd like it to. So um, it's time to start rethinking how we teach science. And I think the fact that um, it shouldn't be um, unusual to think of science as a hands-on learning project. Um, it's, it's not something that you just open up a book and read. It has to be something that you see and feel and touch and, and hear. Um, and smell, uh, as those of us who've been <laughs> in chemistry classes know. Um, but that's the important part of science. So I'm really excited uh, about these this change, and I'm even more excited that science teachers are excited about it. Kathleen and Eileen. Yeah, well, I want to thank you all too. You've done a terrific job over the last several years of bringing this to us, and I I wanted to just clarify something. Some of the people who testified today, I think, have a misunderstanding of what these are, and you you explained it, and you explained it. But my understanding is that we'll still be teaching, or the teachers will still be the curriculum will still include the basic facts of science. The the the, the one person who testified said, the, like, the, how, what goes to make up the body. Uh, that's still in the curriculum, I'm sure before the, so that they'll understand what they're going to be working on. But facts are facts, and they will get those facts, but they'll get it in a more interesting way. And that's the thing that's so exciting about this. I remember when my children went to, they were in elementary school, the science teacher was not what we would hope science teachers would be. And she completely turned them all off. But it can be when I've gone to other when I've gone to other schools and seen science teachers who were good, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. And I have a granddaughter who actually teaches chemistry and physics at a high school in Knoxville, Tennessee, of all places. So I know it can happen. And she came from a family of uh, social studies types, <laughs> so it was like an anomaly. I don't know how she got there, but she did. <laughs> and she she loves it. Mm -hmm. And obviously she's doing a good job. So I, it's great that all the, the teachers are so excited about that. That's, this is very positive, and I think it will be an improvement. I think the people who are concerned about it will find that it's not what they fear, and it's very good. We hope so. Thank you, Eileen. Um, thank you. And I want to point out that nothing is ever static, and nothing is ever final, and science knowledge is changing as we sit here. Um, I appreciate uh, the uh, concerned emails that the board has been flooded with for the last, um, I'd say, 24 hours. In response, I want to make sure a couple of points are covered. Uh, first of all, uh, implementation of any change in K-12 is always a complex undertaking, but complex doesn't mean, it doesn't equal costly. And I think that that's been a point that we haven't really talked about because uh, uh, Michigan and other st all other states uh, overhaul their state standards in every subject on a seven to ten year cycle. And uh, schools are used to that and it's built into their budgets and it's built into ours. Um, I would say that uh, some uh, new standards are more jarring than others in terms of changing practice, uh, teacher practice. And uh, at times in Michigan, we seem to miss this, the importance of what the changes are. There are many, many uh, uh, concerns that parents have right now about um, our 2010 math standards. 95% um, of it, maybe even 98%, boils down to the curriculum that the local district is choosing, not the standards themselves. But it's very hard for us to reach parents and tell them that. And uh, in this particular case, uh, because we have so much enthusiasm from the science teachers themselves and also from uh, math teachers on this, I think that we're going to, while it's going to be very different, uh, very engaging for teachers, I think they're ready for it because they found that teaching kids information in silos, in, in uh, subject silos, doesn't allow the child to really connect the dots and to learn across and to be able to solve something that may look like a biology problem initially but may end up being chemistry or physics. Um, that's where our world is headed. 3D printing now went from plastics to airplane wings to houses to uh, organs. Uh, doctors, mm -hmm. physicians are making organs out of uh, 3D um, printing. So the, the world that these children are entering, my 15-year-old, um, it's a little late for him, but I hear other people pretty hopeful about their kids. <laughs> um, the world that they're entering really needs this kind of integration. 
uh, uh, another criticism I've heard is that um, uh, we, they're not tested, standards aren't tested. I have a couple of answers to that. One is it's the chicken and the egg problem. Standards are followed by implementation and assessment. You can't tell how students are going to do until the cycle is completed, until the circle is completed. But the current MSTEP results, which Cassandra just cited, 12% um, proficient in grade four uh, uh, science, 23% uh, proficient in grade seven science, 29% proficient in grade 11 science, beg for a solution. And uh, I would say that um, this, already we're seeing results uh, on the whole of next gen, which is not what we're adopting. Mm -hmm. Plus we've altered this to include Michigan-centric information. But I would say that we have a little bit of, in Michigan, an interesting experiment going on because a number of schools have adopted a curriculum called Project Lead the Way. It's in place in 118 schools right now in Michigan. And uh, one of the more interesting ones that I visited is the West Michigan Aviation Academy. They have biomedical uh, curricula, they have uh, aviation curricula, they have several others. And they, this brings um, science and math and um, uh, engineering alive to children so that it becomes part of how they function and how they think. Students love learning this way and they're showing solid achievement. As to the Fordham uh, state uh, standard ratings, the, these, the Fordham rated uh, the state's standards in 2012 and then in 2013 did an evaluation of the entirety of NextGen, which we're not adopting today. Um, besides the National Research uh, Council's guidance on how, what's, what things have to be taught and the stellar endorsements that that particular set of standards has, we watch our colleagues who are the other states. Uh, Fordham rated 13 states as having better standards than next gen. Five of those states have already adopted it. California, Arkansas, Kansas, Maryland, and uh, the District of Columbia. Uh, they rated 22 states at roughly the same level of uh, standards competence. We were one of those. Of that group, six have adopted. And they said that 16 states had standards lower than ours uh, currently are. Five of those states have adopted, and the next-gen standards are two years old. So again, nothing's ever perfect. Uh, my speech has gone on long enough. And uh, uh, in the time that I have done this, we've had nine earthquakes and uh, <laughs> four new elements, four new chemical elements. Thank you. Okay. All right, seeing no other hands, all those in favor. Oh, sorry, Richard. Yeah. Um, I feel the need to explain my dissent. Uh, back in 2014, when, when we thought we were going to adopt, uh, look at these that year, I, I read the framework and I posted what has turned out to be the, the most, regarded as the most helpful review on Amazon. Um, <laughs> but, and, who, who's counting? but who's counting? Right. Um, and, and I was troubled by the vision set forth there. Mainly, uh, the report itself says that most, most college graduates who majored in science don't understand what science is. And that raises the question, well, where will we find the expertise for changes so vast and sweeping? Uh, so that, and where is the continuity be between what we formerly called science and science instruction and, and what we understand ourselves to be adopting now? So there's a problem of continuity. Uh, and, and is the vision itself coherent? Um, the other thing, now, now uh, my, my respected colleague Eileen uh, made a, a virtue out of a vice, but you know, we plan to change standards every seven years or so. That means no one has the benefit of 12 years under the same standards. There is something dysfunctional about systems that do this. And it may be demonstrated in our ACT scores and the very <coughs> low scores that we have now, we've been told for both social studies and science that, oh, that, that form of labeling instruction doesn't work. It doesn't help kids reach the higher. We can't even get our kids to label if that's the case. There's a structure to learning, and you begin with labeling with tedium. You see it in learning a foreign language. You spend two years of you know, working through meaningless grammar and stuff like that, and then the third or fourth year, if you're lucky, it clicks and it starts to make sense and it becomes enjoyable and self-reinforcing. I don't believe that there's a way to teach and skip that tedium stage. And 
attempts to try to teach science, allowing kids to pursue their interest, well, sometimes it can go very well. There are many students who very prosper, but there are the kids that don't. Um, and I'll just close with my banker had, had two sons and sent one to the Detroit Free School and you follow your interests there and he, he was really interested in electricity and uh, he, he did great there. And then the other son went to the same Detroit Free School. He was interested in setting fires and they ended up sending him to the school that I ran which was much more traditional structured kind of approach. And which only illustrates that there are, if kids are different, then, then approaches uh, need to be different and made available. Choices need to be available for kids, even from the same, even from the same family. Now, where this leaves us on the current uh, matter of the science standards, um, given the whole, the bigger picture for me does not cohere so I will be unable to uh, support it. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. All right, all those are uh, <laughs> Lupe? I just want to say one short thing. Uh, the current standards were approved in 2005, so that means the standards are 20 years old. Yeah. 10, 10, 10, 10 years old, 10 years old, but even 10 years, we're not uh, using the same phones that we used 10 years ago. We're not using the same computers that we used 10 years ago. And I just changed my 10-year-old car. Uh, and even eyeglasses. You don't wear the same kind of eyeglasses that you did 10 years ago because everything changes. So in my mind, uh, it is clear that changes are well overdue for the science standards. So I am in favor of supporting the new science standards. Thank you. Let's see if third time's a charm. <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Good job, everyone. Next item on today's agenda <laughs> is state and federal legislative update. Marty, I think they're applying for you, or applauding for you. There you go. Yeah. Marty Ackley will provide an update on state and federal legislative issues. Of course, Cassandra Albrecht, our chair of the board's legislative committee, will share an update. And uh, we may have Kathleen Strauss give us a NASB update. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly used to the applause. <laughs> Brian? Yeah, oh, and Larry Bay is going to do something as well. All right, Marty, let's go. Yeah, there was a, uh, we, we had a, um, Legislative Committee meeting last Monday. Um, All right. And the uh, the main focus of the of the meeting was discussing the uh, pending legislation on the governor's uh, plan for Detroit schools and children in Detroit schools. Um, and I will pass it over to the chairman of the committee, Cassandra Albert. Hi. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so yes, we had a very light agenda um, this past week. And we were hoping that the legislation related to the governor's education plan for Detroit would have been introduced and we could have been reflective of the specific language. Um, unfortunately, as you know, the legislation has not been formally introduced, at least as far as we know, as of 2.45 p.m. Um, so, but the members of the State Board of Education uh, separately and individually were fortunate to receive an overview of the plan from members of the governor's staff um, so we do have a, a very good idea of what's in the legislation, not necessarily the, the language itself. Um, a, a majority of the committee thought that it would be important to reflect on the general plan in the interest of providing a small amount of feedback in a more general fashion of those items that um, we were supportive of. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to John, who I know has a few comments, and then we'll Thanks, read the statement. Thank you for your leadership. I hope the governor's plan is, is being introduced um, because I really think it's important for us as a state to take action to improve learning outcomes for Detroit school children, whatever public school they're going to, which is the point. And I think we should applaud the governor for his leadership and for proposing action um, to help all school children in Detroit public schools learn. Um, this uh, statement we have been working on a bit. Um, I think it, the major uh, points that I hope we are making are we support several of the main features of the governor's proposal, uh, particularly one, bringing 
some quality management uh, through the Detroit Education Commission to what is a network of public schools charter, DPS, EAA, uh, and mm -hmm. serving those children with a quality education and access to mm -hmm. it better. Um, you know, a combination of demographics, Richard, declining enrollments almost everywhere, and sort of policies that wittingly or unwittingly have sort of led to a crazy quilt of new schools being created, opening, closing, <laughs> charters, <laughs> new choices being taken up, uh, has hurt learning. I mean, look at the recent TED scores. Kids are not learning in these, this family of Detroit schools, charter, traditional. And that is what we need to focus on, what we should care about. Um, to the proposals for getting Detroit's public schools on a solid financial footing, taking care of a debt that the state owes itself, which is only going to grow larger unless we find a way to pay it off. Those are very welcome proposals. I think the, the one recommendation we have for improving the governor's plan would be to suggest that the system of new governance, uh, commission, uh, uh, Detroit public um, schools um, governance, would work best, and it certainly would be broadly supported by all, including the citizens of Detroit, if those governance models were created so they're clearly accountable, whoever's appointed or whoever's elected, to the people of Detroit, that you restore political accountability to folks elected by the people. It could be through the mayor, through appointments, majority appointments versus the current proposal of the governor, uh, returning as soon as possible to elected board members for DPS. Uh, but I think starting with clear political accountability to the citizens of Detroit in managing and governing this system would just take off the table this issue of state takeover, sta ongoing state control, which rightfully engenders such fierce opposition. Uh, and it would take that off the table from the get-go. And we have a mayor, certainly, and the citizens of Detroit that could be trusted to um, manage their affairs. And uh, you could build in um, checkpoints if things go south, financially or otherwise. Uh, they could be uh, a revert to a state control, but we have to bring political accountability back to the citizens of Detroit in new governance of these systems. So in this statement, we're trying to, we are plotting and, and supporting the major governance for quality and access to quality, uh, school financing that takes care of the debt and encouraging uh, uh, democratic political accountable to citizens of Detroit governance of this rebooted Detroit family of schools, um, charter traditional DPS and EAA from the get-go. Um, All right, so do you have a statement you want to read? Yeah, I'll read the statement and then uh, we can entertain a motion. Uh, so the statement reads, the children of Detroit deserve and are, and are entitled to a quality education. For too long, they have not been served well by such a system. The State Board of Education agrees that it is time to instill a sense of normalcy, stability, and respect to the educational framework in Detroit. We welcome a public dialogue on how best to improve educational outcomes for students. The State Board of Education eagerly awaits the release of draft legislation depicting the governor's announced plan for Detroit schools. Having been briefed on the direction of the proposed legislation, the State Board of Education shares the following areas of support and recommendations for improvement in the plan. Quality schools. The focus must remain on providing a quality education for all children of Detroit regardless of economic status, disability, language barriers, and other challenges. Improvement is always a difficult task, but it is even more so under conditions that create instability in enrollment, services, and access. With 95 Detroit public schools, 97 charter schools, and 15 Education Achievement Authority schools, Detroit parents have plenty of choices. What they often lack are easily accessible quality choices. We support proposals that better ensure quality education across all public schools and the ability of all Detroit children and parents to access them. Two is debt reduction. The state of Michigan has had direct oversight of DPS for over a decade during a time of growing deficits. The State Board of Education supports proposals whereby the state assumes responsibility for paying off this debt before it grows larger and without <coughs> penalizing other schools and students in Michigan. And finally, political accountability. Detroit Public Schools has been under state control for nearly 15 years and currently is experiencing its fourth emergency manager. In addition, 15 former DPS schools are now controlled by the state-created Education Achievement Authority. 
The current plan calls for additional state control in the form of a majority governor appointed Detroit Education Commission, as well as an initial majority governor appointed Detroit Community School District Board. The State Board of Education is concerned about the continuing lack of citizen oversight over their own schools. It's time to restore political accountability to the people of Detroit. We support proposals that provide democratic governance and oversight of Detroit's public schools that is politically accountable to Detroit residents. Is there a motion to adopt? Is there support? Support. It's been moved and supported. Discussion, please. Eileen, please. I have a friendly amendment um, to propose. Um, for debt reduction, the second to the last line, the and and the colon would disappear. It would read, for paying off this debt before it grows larger without penalizing other schools and students in Michigan. And for the last section, I would head it governance. I would strike the sentence, it's time to restore political accountability to the people of Detroit. I hear the passion and the anger and the frustration of the people of Detroit, but we don't know and we can't anticipate exactly how those negotiations will end up, and I don't want an inflammatory statement in, a, in an otherwise quite good uh, summary of, of, uh, of the two sides' uh, difficulties in negotiating. The last thing that I would do is the sentence that reads, we support proposals that provide democratic governance and oversight of Detroit's public schools that is accountable to Detroit residents, or to say that is politically and educationally accountable to Detroit residents. Because in the end, it's education that we're worried about, not politics. So that was moved an amendment. Is there support to the amendment? Um, I'll the support. Mover. It's, uh, yep. it's yeah. been moved and supported. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, I w in the spirit of I'm very eager to have a statement we all can support, so I'm eager to accommodate your suggestions. Um, I, would, uh, I would, by way of just indicating the point of that clause that you're striking, Eileen, as you well know, there's there's hopes and I think we should all work towards uh, paying off this debt without um, having to come from the school aid fund where other school districts and students may. It's just an editing minutes. comment. That was so, not content. Yeah, so that was the point of including that clause. I think just saying that out loud, uh, we all hear it. Uh, it would be, it would engender better, broader support, certainly for this, if we weren't robbing Peter to pay Paul. And I think we should all strive and encourage the legislature and the governor to be creative in how this could be funded. But the main point is, yes, we need to pay off the debt. So I'm you say you would change the language? No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing to strike it. I'm just making the well, point of what, what's that? She didn't strike it. I didn't strike it. She just said oh. take out and. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then I'm even happier. So thank you. <laughs> that was just a <laughs> and technical think, amendment. Good. And you were saying it's time, strike, it's time to restore political accountability to the people of Detroit. Right. Yes, because I believe that's a contentious statement. I understand that that's going to be a huge negotiating item, and I just think we should I be neutral. Should be neutral. Well, I do think um, yes. in continuing to include oversight governance of Detroit's public schools that is politically and educationally accountable, as you suggest, yeah, does make the clear point. I mean, the point is we want those governance uh, entities to clearly be folks who are uh, accountable and, and were elected by the people of Detroit. And I would flip it to educationally and politically. So I accept this is those not about politics, it's I accept about children. Those amendments. <laughs> I'm just uh, underscoring the, the okay. point that it's very important to make. I think we can get rid of the state takeover uh, concern ongoing if we are working towards something that has the folks in Detroit uh, and the leaders they elect being the ones uh, accountable for, for managing their affairs. Kathleen, is it on the amendment? Yeah, uh, no, it's about a, All right, so let me take care of the amendment uh, first. Uh, if, if John accepts the amendment, do we... I know, let's do it the right way, though. Uh, let's vote on the amendment. All in favor of the I, amendment? I want to know, the yep. amendment is that just this here. last sentence, and what about the one, the other one? You don't okay, have another just a minute, Kathleen yep. and I are working. Yep. <laughs> okay, larger without penalizing, it's just an edit. Oh, just take I, that. I oh. quibble with John's semicolon and Oh, and. okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she was an amendment. Large no, yeah, well, you no. know, it's an amendment. That was a very I'll, small amendment. And this would become semicolon. governance. <laughs> oh, <laughs> on the altar of bipartisanship. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, semicolon. Right. Everybody know this? I've okay. given up an okay. Oxford And then it's the, it would strike <laughs> no, the I wouldn't go that far. Because that's going to end up having to be negotiated. So that one would strike. And then down here, what I said is, for the last line, schools that is educationally and politically accountable. Okay. All right. On the question of the amendment, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Same. Amendment is adopted back to the full resolution. Is there any other questions or comments on the full resolution, I Kathleen? Yes, I have to make amendments. I was going to make an edit, proposed amendment. I know, but it's just well, process. Let me just tell you what I wanted to <laughs> suggest. In the first sentence, uh, the, the second clause, well, no, the second sentence, they have not yet been served well by such a system. We haven't referred to a system first. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to say to be served by, such, by the present complicated system. Well, I don't think it was just the present complicated system. I thought we were talking about the current, under the past couple governors and even before. I thought we're saying in Detroit well, they haven't we been well served. Yes. Unless you add the, the word system to the end of the first sentence, are entitled to a quality education. They have not been served well, period. Not been. I yeah, support you're right. that. Served well, period. Could I make a comment on that? Yeah. You know, um, my kids have been served well by Detroit Public Schools. And I'm a parent, and I've raised a lot of kids in Detroit Public Schools. So I take issue that the kids have not been served well. You know what? If we haven't been, it's been a struggle, and it's been a fight. And it's not just for the kids. It's for the parents, and it's for the teachers and the educators that are working there. And that, and that was, I would like that recognized here. So I, you know, I don't, I, you know, peop people, Detroit is really struggling or really fighting. But to, to make a general statement that children are not served well, um, I think instead that, you know, um, there are problems with the system. And maybe, you know, what I, I, what I tried to do um, or think about was what those problems were. You know, it's not the whole system. There's, uh, there's issues of instability. There's issues of, you know, uh, no community input or... Uh, or, you know, say and in in, in where, uh, you know, schools are, are closed or open. Um, there, are, there are problems that make educating really difficult and challenging, but to say it's a complete failure, I think, is an insult to well, the yeah, people who work there and live there and fight. I don't think we meant to say it's a complete failure, but. Okay. Maybe we should move some of the stuff. Maybe. Maybe. What about just, yes. oh. we should delete what about it. just striking the sentence, uh, the second sentence in the first paragraph and just saying the children to deserve, to try deserve and are entitled to a quality education. The State Board of Education agrees at this time to instill a sense. All right, so let's try to do this appropriately. So we have an motion to drop the second sentence of the first paragraph. Second. It's been moved and supported. Any comments on that? Let's make a comment. I, it's, it's I, I agree with moving ahead. I think, Michelle, the point that was trying to be made is I don't think you would agree that the outcomes for kids on balance with whatever system we have of traditional DPS EA charters is, is – serving well by most of those students in terms of the learning that comes from. I, I hear you very clearly, though. We don't want to say something that says that it you know, blames Detroit for failure. Um, and so, you know, there would be ways to make an affirmative statement. For too long, too many of Detroit's young people have not gotten the education that they deserve in whatever way. But I think for simplicity, let's just strike okay. it and and agree on all the things we can't agree on because it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's not worth the kind of semantic noodling. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. I, 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 but I just think there are some glaring things that are, you know, seem, seem self-evident about that are wrong, and um, and I, I'm not sure why it's. I mean, the coal, you know, everyone seems to recognize them, and so pointing them out, um, I'm not sure why that's. <coughs> you know, like just the instability that that is created there. Um, that well, I think that's what was attempted to say. They have not been served well by exactly the things that you're summing up. There's a lot of reasons why uh, none of right. the kids are succeeding. Right, and that instability could be caused from right. many different sources. I'm not, playing, you know, blaming one person. It's that whatever, but there are certain reasons why. I just. I guess it's important to me to recognize um, that it's not just the children, it's the families that have have been um, really uh, struggling with this, the citizens, not just the children, and it's also the people who work in that system who have been um, uh, struggling with that. So, so I, um, 
and you don't want to blame them. I understand. Here, here. Uh, well, yeah, I want to recognize the fact that people have been really working hard and, and in spite of it, have been producing, you know, the, um, that there's, there are some good things that are coming out of it. It's just that it's the, 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 the system is, is rigged to make it really, really hard. And um, so I don't, I, well, there was a, a, a different sentence that we had used that, it, that I had thought of before um, and that, on this. Discussions earlier, that sentence proved so provocative to many that we tried to simplify it with just this one sentence, that the system you're describing, whatever that is, that complex of forces is not working for Detroit's education. Um, you know, it is a system, it's a complex of forces. But I would strongly encourage, let's, you, people, I've heard your points, I think, I appreciate mm -hmm. your point. Mm -hmm. I think let's just strike that sentence and leave the first, which I think we all could agree on. All the kids in Detroit deserve a great education. And now let's talk about it. And, and I would just add, um, I completely understand what you're saying. This is our, this is a, the first chance. Yeah. I know that it's definitely not gonna be the last one we have to um, add our thoughts to the process. All right, so it's been moved and supported to strike the second second sentence. Second sentence. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries. We're back to the full. Wait, I have another suggestion. <laughs> Is that it? Well, no. Yes. You missed the boat. In the, in the uh, one, two, three, fourth paragraph, the one that says quality schools, the uh, second sentence, improvement is always a difficult task but is even more so under conditions that create instability. And I would add, the put in first the word leaders, instability in leadership. I think that's been a real problem, that they've had four successive emergency managers, and each one comes in with different ideas, and there's no stability at all. And it says instability in enrollment, services, and access, but I think the leadership is part of the problem. Okay, so there is that a motion? It's been moved and supported to add the word leadership. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in Oh, Richard? Just, I think the point is well taken. That's a good addition. There you go, Kathy. Good job. Good all those in favor of adding the word, say aye. Aye. Opposed the same. Back to the full resolution. Any other amendments? I don't Pam? I Bam probably, and then Lupe? No, no, no. I probably should just get in here because uh, to me, after hearing from Detroit, really trying to uh, take this document, digest it, and be able to, you know, back it along with, with my fellow board members, but I really am having a hard time um, at, along with some of the things that Michelle has, has brought up. It, the statement to me is ambiguous because we're pointing out some of the issues, but to me we're still saying that we're going along with the proposal that we're awaiting to, or the legislation that we're waiting to um, um, be proposed by the governor. And, and I, I don't think that I can do that. I do appreciate, you know, the governor coming to us and presenting his plan to us. Um, and, and I do appreciate that. But I guess some of the questions for me um, arrive from the presentations that were given. The other things that I don't know are, are in here, because we're looking at, what, six six to eight years that there will be um, governance by the appointed um, the majority governors. Well, we're going to work to change that, obviously. Can I, mm -hmm. could I just respond? Mm -hmm. I, I believe what we are saying pretty clearly here is, and I believe the Detroit Coalition members also are saying, they support the two provisions, major provisions, of a new governance structure that attends to quality and access, uh, a plan for dealing with the debt that the state executes to take care of the debt. We are disagreeing and we're recommending a change in the governor's proposal to not start with governor appointed governance of the DEC or the DPS, but to start with uh, appointments that are, or election uh, that are made by people elected by the people of Detroit, either the mayor or elected board members. Okay. Majority and on both. So that is what we're clearly saying here. And so the current board that was elected, many of them receiving many more vo votes than the governor. What are we talking about doing with that current board? As you know, the governor's proposal says there's going to be an old DPS and new DPS. The old DPS is managing the just the debt uh, service. Those are the elected board members of today. That's not, you know, who would want to be an elected board member for something that has nothing to do? 
but the specific proposals around governance that are in the governor's plan are a Detroit Education Commission to call balls and strikes and manage quality that in his proposal starts with majority governor appointments, majority, uh, minority mayor appointments. Um, we would want to recommend and are here that you start with majority appointments to that that are made by the mayor as a person elected by the people of Detroit. So the people of Detroit through their elected official control that or um, elected or elected directly as a board mm -hmm. in the DC and that the new DPS, the governor's proposal says the new DPS, like the new GM, will have to start with majority appointments by the governor, minority by the mayor, and then they will begin to move to elected by Detroiters board members to replace those appointments two every two years. Mm -hmm. So what we are saying here is it would be better to start with that new DPS with either majority appointments by the mayor, not the governor, or even better, major election directly by the people of Detroit of Detroit board members. And I don't, I, uh, I don't think this statement makes a, a distinction one way or the other, whether it's the current elected board or it's a different elected board. It's just saying that it needs to be elected uh, or, you know, uh, politically accountable to the citizens of Detroit. So I don't, I wouldn't read that much that far into it that we're, we're buying into the whole, the current board needs to just get shoved over in the corner. All right, back to Pam. Do you have anything? I got Pam and then Lupe and then Kathleen, but we've got to stick with Pam first here. So, and I, I guess in some of the commentary, and I'm reading through, and, and as well as listening to the commentary, because I cannot applaud the governor um, uh, and his leadership, um, not under what we've seen with the EAA, and um, not with what we're seeing in Flint. I cannot see I that. Think I think we've taken that out, haven't we? Well, I think we're saying thank you for taking this problem on and trying to address that. it. No, I remember <laughs> yeah. someone earlier we, we had, said they don't we had like the word a applause. applause. I just so said, I said out loud. Oh, you said, okay. I said that. I, I, again, um, I personally believe uh, what the governor is taking on is the fact of we have created, enabled through public policy uh, and the demographic changes a not working to educate kids constellation of schools, chartered DPS, EPA, uh, uh, EAA, we have too many schools chasing too few kids and we didn't control for quality and we don't have any plan for how they open in the right places and serve the kids of Detroit well. He's willing to take that on and say we need a mechanism, hopefully governed by politically accountable to Detroiters uh, commission members who are going to help manage to quality all of those schools. That's a big important contribution. Uh, that is a really important thing we need to do so that whether you're in a charter school, a public school, DPS school, or an EAA school, we're insisting that you get a quality education. Right, and to me that whole ball of, you know, it's been referred to a, as a family of a schools or a network of school, but it's a, a big confu confusion and ball of chaos to me that has been created. But there were some questions that were raised by the, um, um, by the folks from the community of Detroit, the Board of Detroit. They asked for an audit. Um, and we had a little bit of discussion about that. I guess, you know, how would that, how would those things fit within this discussion? Because um, I want to make sure that, that we're taking those things into consideration. Um, and if that would be a part of what we would be um, saying that we agree to along, you know, with, with what the governor is, is proposing. Um. Well, I, I don't think we understand what they're requesting in an audit. And as Cassandra said, this isn't our only bite at the apple. So I'm not saying we can't address that issue, but I certainly hope we don't address it today because I don't think any of us understand what that point is. Okay. Well, I can't support this because one of the things that they did ask for was an audit before any um, legislation went, went forward. So I would want to get clear understanding on what that is. And we don't know exactly what's in the legislation. Right. Um, we do know what some of the major, the, the, I would say, three major features of it are. And I, I hope what we're saying today is we support two of the three features and we would recommend a different way to go about the governance so that it, it, it could be uh, take away the state takeover um, problem. Right, and, I, and just, you know, as a person from an urban school district, the Detroit school district and now the Flint school district, you know, they're like 
canaries in, in a coal mine. I mean, they're, they're taking the brunt of things that all of us could feel. And I, I'm just not, you know, seeing the leadership um, and uh, that's needed um, from this administration and, and, and with everything else that's going on. It's just, you know, I, I can't support or say that I'm eagerly awaiting to see that legislation from him. Okay, Lupe. <laughs> I, I just was looking at a grammatical error uh, in political accountability. <laughs> Detroit Public Schools has or have <laughs> been under state. Well, I think if you capitalize the P and the S, then has is correct. If you don't, then it's have. I think we're referring to Detroit Public Schools as the form of district. The district public the district. schools should be capitalized. Yeah, yeah. I think oh. that's the problem. Yeah. Okay. We'll take care of that, friend. Thank well, you. I, I uh, am really on the same page as Pam, in a, in a sense. I really wanted to say I wanted her to restore the, ele the elected board, the currently elected board to be in charge. To have a currently <coughs> elected board in charge of doing nothing is really the biggest insult that you can, you can just, they're just writing them off as if they're not existent. They should be in charge of the new district. Let the new appointed governor appointed board be in charge of paying off the debt. Well, I just reverse that. I, and I, you know, I don't know if I could have gotten support for that, but I think Kathy, I believe the, the people state, that the I talked to in Detroit are so angry about not having their <coughs> power. They're furious, and they're not going to support anything that doesn't restore that. And it's, I, I think the Detroit delegation in the legislature is also very committed to getting the, the elected board back. Kevin, now, this, this I mean, not wait for two years, four years, six years, eight years. This is consistent with that. I don't think that's clear. Um, there are two new pro governance proposals. One is for the Detroit Education Commission, which would manage quality for EAA, DPS, new DPS, and the charter network that has no management right now. And that is proposed by the governor, majority appointments by the governor. I think mean, we are saying, we w those that body should be governed by folks politically accountable to Detroiters. A majority, one way to do it would be majority appointed by the mayor, but then they're the still new, not elected. No, then the new DPS. Even the best thing would be to have that not start with governor and majority appointments, but to start with democratically elected DPS um, board members. That would be consistent with what this says. You should have governance of that. Con that's politically you say democratically accountable. elected. If you, you say democratically elected or appointed, they should be democratically elected. We didn't say or appointed. We just said Democratic folks. But they should be governed by folks who are politically accountable to the citizens of Detroit. The way that's accomplished is by the governance being um, being dominated or in total, either folks that are elected or appointed by someone who is elected by the voters of Detroit. Well, that's different. See, that's I want it to be elected. Period. As I'm saying, we have two new entities, so um, this was trying to say something that both of those entities should be governed by folks who are elected or accountable to someone elected by the people of Detroit, which is consistent with having a, a, I, I would, a new DPS board that's directly elected would be the fastest way to go. The governor's proposal right now is that new DPS board starts out with majority appointments by the governor and minority by the I think, uh, mayor. I think what Kathleen is saying, though, is you already have the democratically elected board in the city of Detroit, why couldn't they be the ones who can who go with the new Detroit DPS or whatever it's called? And this yeah. there's there's this is consistent with that outcome so as well. To him. I don't think that's all all really. Kathleen finish. Are you done, Kathleen? All right, Pam. I think my question is to what Kathy is speaking to I don't, was the DPS board consulted in any of this? I mean, to me, they're just like a total outsider. I mean, I, to me, the presentation that they just gave today was during comment period, and obviously they had the opportunity to come last week or last month or the month before last, but how have they been engaged in this? I, have, I do not know. All I do know is that what this statement clearly says, we disagree with the governor's initial proposal, as we understand it, to start off with um, state-appointed um, governance of the ongoing Detroit schools. We are saying just pretty clearly 
after all the preamble of all these different entities, the State Board of Education is concerned about the continuing lack of citizen oversight over their own schools. We support proposals, could be exactly what Kathy's proposing, that provide democratic governance and oversight of Detroit's public schools that is politically and educationally accountable to Detroit residents. Perfectly consistent with Kathy's encouragement. That's and so how do you, I thought we crossed out some of that. All right, I know people have a meeting to get to shortly. Uh, do you want to continue discussion or are you ready to vote? Okay. No, uh, I want to make a motion to table the statement of Detroit educational proposal until we have more information on what audit uh, residents were talking about and we have more explanation and, and some of these concerns are settled. It's been moved to table. Is there support for the motion to table? Is, is point of order, is that even legitimate? I mean, you have a, another motion on the floor right now, so do you have to vote on that motion first? I thought I don't know the answer. That's why I'm asking. Yes, a, a motion to table would, would take be precedence. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> motion to table, table takes, takes precedence. To table it until, until we have more. Until the bills are dropped. Until more, we get more information on the audit and the information that the residents brought, and more answers to your questions. Well, I, I don't. I don't need more answers to the question. I think we ought to take. Okay. A um, <laughs> yeah, I, think I don't want to wait. Hey, he's running the meeting. <laughs> I think we should yeah. weigh in on the. Uh, on this something before everything is decided. Yeah, I agree, and I do honestly believe, Kathy, it, the fully intent of Brian, your point is for a is second to, before we discuss. Is consistent with this language. Yes, we do we need to restore second. democratically elected political accountability to well, the government. I governance. hope people understand. Why don't make All right, so a motion has been made to table. That takes president, but there has not been a second. Is there a second to the motion to table? Hearing none, that motion fails. To take the presence, we're back to the original motion to support the resolution. Um, I wanted to respond to some of the things that Pam has said. I think it's a brave, and um, uh, and and I understand um, where you're coming from. Um, I'm just wondering if there's, you know, uh, it's a small change. Um, I still, <laughs> I still um, personally would like to have some discussion of what. Um, ind indication of what the, the issues are um, facing uh, the folks in Detroit, but maybe the last sentence, we support proposals that provide democratic governance and oversight, and that is politically, uh, educationally, politically, and financially accountable to the Detroit residents. Um, I don't know if we could add something about um, um, uh, we support um, uh, an audit um, of the, um, this includes supporting an audit of the, uh, you know, the current. But uh, see, we get an audit already. We get an audit that has to be filed by every November something. Fifteen. So they are doing. Well, yeah, audits are current law. See, that's why I think they're talking about something different. Yes, yeah. that's what I want to get clarification because those are internal audits. Are no, they? it's done by I don't know who Detroit uses, but Plant Moran outside sources. Yeah that come in and that audit, every school district in the state, and every school district in the state has to file that audit with the department. Right, I think that they're speaking of something different. I, they are, that's why we're not clear on. That's why you, so. you, need, you need to second. It? I call the question. All right, the question has been called. Well, we're gonna add, are we gonna add the word? Did you wanna add, just let me clarify, because yeah. be, before we called the question, there wasn't a question to add the word. And financially. And financially. So there was that a motion, Michelle? Okay, okay there's moved. Is it seconded? Yes. Seconded. All those in favor? Is there any discussion? Where, where are you going to add that? The last sentence. The very last sentence. Politically so, uh, fine, uh, and uh, financially. Educationally, politically, politically and right. financially. I'm sorry. It's Right now it says politically. We already added the word educationally, politically, and now we're going to say and financially accountable to Detroit residents. Uh, and we are doing what right now? We're voting. I'm on adding that word. On that word. Yeah, I, I just want to ask one question before, yep. if you don't mind. Uh, is there anything in the proposal that prohibits financial accountability? I'm, I'm, that's why I'm curious. Is, uh, to me, everything about that proposal was that it was going to be uh, solidly accountable. That's why I was just, just suggesting that we just say accountable initially. 
but I, I it, we can underscore the importance, but I believe that in the proposals I've seen, that that's part of the package. Am I wrong? It doesn't make any difference. We can say it, too. Okay. Okay. I think the intended, it. which it's offered, is, is helpful. Um, I don't even want to say it out loud, but I'm just worried someone could interpret that and financially to me, oh, you mean they're going to pay off their own debt? which is the opposite um, of the second bullet that we want to make clear that we, um, it's yeah. the state. Yeah, I don't think you want to add the word financially. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I pointed that we used I was going to walk back, <laughs> Michelle. Yeah. Because someone would read that as, oh, see, we don't have to pay off this. All right. So that, so that has been withdrawn. So we go to the call to question motion. So all those in favor of the original motion, at, now you have a draft thing as amended. Yes. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nay. Motion has carried 7 1. Uh, I, very quickly. 6 1 1. Oh, I oh, you abstain. Sorry, I didn't call for that, so I didn't know that. 6 you 1 abstained. 1. Thank you. I abstain. All right. So, well, Kathleen Strauss, do you have a quick NASB update? Well, yes. The, the, uh, <coughs> apparently, they think there's action on the, uh, could be action on ESEA before the end of the year. That's a possibility. But uh, they've got, they haven't named the conferees yet, but apparently from what we heard yesterday at the conference call was that the chairman of the two committees, uh, uh, Alexander, Alexander and John Klein, have been meeting behind the scenes to try to agree them. Uh, and the, and <clears throat> the other encouraging thing is that Two Republican representatives in the House have written a letter, I think I sent this to all of you, uh, to encourage their Republican colleagues to support a conference report, uh, which no one has seen yet, but uh, they're working on it. And the, the problem is they're also working on the budget. <laughs> they, you know, they passed a resolution to go for two years, but the details haven't been worked out. So. They're still working on that, so that might take up all the time because they're not going to be in session very long. But they're hoping that they will get this done before the end of the year. So that it's a possibility. So your letter was, should be helpful. So I will be sending a letter to all of our congressional and senators, our delegation, encourage yeah. them to adopt. Correct. Right. All right, Lupe has withdrawn her item, so that uh, leads us to consent. I, oh. I'm sorry, I have, I have a question. Yep. And I just want to make sure that we're clear on this uh, as it relates to the presentation and the discussion that we had around the Detroit um, schools plan. Are yep. we, how are we going to follow, follow up with the request for an audit? I will have my team, that. my team okay. will do that. Thank you for clarifying that, but I did write down the note okay. to do that. Consent agenda, are there any items the board wishes to be removed from the consent agenda prior to the vote? Seeing none, is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Support. It's been moved and supported to accept the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Any other comments by State Board of Education members? I have a couple, but I'll hold them. <laughs> Real quick, I want to thank all my colleagues for this thoughtful and uh, constructive work together on the big issues today. Yes. So we agree on a very, very appreciate <laughs> Richard, uh, I want to thank uh, John and Cassandra for their work on the on that last resolution. There, I uh, um, complex. It was complex, and and, well and I, I appreciate your willing to to modify language so that I could support the policy initiatives. Thank you. Same here, Brian. Somebody, yep. someone, one of our um, public speakers, uh, someone who presented public speaking, discussed the time of meetings. Obviously, I know I, that happened before I was here and probably for some sort of reason. Um, what I've told people who have questioned that, educators, is that the recordings, the, these sessions are recorded. Are there any other discussions that we've had on the time of meeting and making sure that we're accommodating the uh, general public to attend meetings? I mean, we've not had anybody contact us with a concern about the time. I, I know we did hear uh, the two ladies that testified together. I wasn't sure they were saying it was tough on them to talk to us or other meetings, but, but you're right, we did hear that comment. And then the other thing that was brought up during public comment was um, parents who have difficult times 
um, expressing themselves and getting response back from educators without seeming adversarial and I've seen that with families and I think that you know however we can talk to um, our school systems and help them to support them in accommodating their community and taking their input and um, doing it that in a non-adversarial way I think that um, you know however we can do that the more we can do that as we um, relate and communicate with with districts very good we'll add that thank you all right uh, tentative agenda for the next meeting if anybody has any items please let John Cassandra Michelle Marilyn I anybody know uh, if you have anything you'd like to add future meeting dates Tuesday December 8th regular meeting Tuesday January 12th regular meeting Tuesday February 9th regular meeting and it is our goal uh, to do the top 10 hopefully at December 8th if we're behind the latest we'll bring it forward as January 12th but we hope to have that as a major piece either in December or January. With that, we are adjourned. Marilyn.